Well, hi there, folks. Mr. Bleeker again. We're moving into a new chapter. Uh, this is a study of DNA, uh, its history, its structure, how it is expressed to make protein. And it's one of the more substantial chapters that we'll go through in this course. It takes the better part of a week and a half. Uh, depending on what we do, it can take the better part of two weeks. There's a lot to study, um, but the mystery of, of DNA is definitely solved in this chapter. It's one of my favorite topics, very worthwhile. So head down to topic four here um, with the book we're using. It's chapter 25, DNA, the molecular basis of inheritance, and click on the first lesson, which is the history and structure. Before we talk about how DNA does what it does, we have to study how it was discovered. So pretty important. And you'll be in section one. It obviously matches how we progress through the book. And its history is, is absolutely fabulous. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen Jurassic Park, the movie, but the idea that DNA, a genetic code, can be used to bring long dead organisms back to life. In this case, they discover dinosaur DNA and bring back these monsters of the Mesozoic era. And it's an, an amazing idea. Uh, if you think about um, some of the, the modern instances of this, uh, it's not so much science fiction. For example, discovering mastodon DNA from a frozen specimen in the ice, a little guy that froze to death. And is it possible to bring, you know, mastodons back right, from long since extinct on our planet? Well, they're working on it. In fact, DNA is just a blueprint for the construction of an organism and its ongoing maintenance and survival. But if you haven't seen Jurassic Park, I highly recommend it because it's just such a great movie and makes a great predicate for um, discussions in this course. But a lot of people have seen it. Hopefully you have. If you haven't, you probably don't know what this is. This is Mr. DNA from a little segment of the movie where they talk about how DNA works. It's really cute. Um, I like to show it in class, um, talking about the master blueprint of life. But I digress. Away we go. Uh, we have quite a bit to get through. So we'll go through the history and the discovery of DNA. Okay. So DNA in itself, we didn't know what it was for a very long time. Really, once, once we start to approach sort of the epoch of, of modern science, as we turn the corner into the 1900s, um, that's when we really were able to study um, things at a cellular level, we had the equipment and we had built up a certain amount of expertise. I mean, it was first isolated in 1868. Isolating DNA is not that hard because you can break down the membrane of any cell with soap. And if you use a little bit of well, soap and a little bit of alcohol, um, you can liberate DNA from where we know it is now in its nucleus. But it was discovered uh, in the 1800s, late 1800s, just really didn't know what it did. If you've ever done an experiment um, previously in isolating DNA, you probably did the strawberries in the baggie with a little bit of soap and you squish it and mush it and you can get a lot of that snotty like string like material to come out. In this course we'll do a similar experiment. We'll do that but with wheat germ. Wheat germ is excellent for liberating DNA. But even though they were able to isolate it, they didn't know what it did originally. However, an experiment in 1928 changed all that. It was called the Griffiths experiment, and it was an experiment that used um, pneumonia-causing bacteria. And we're going to look at that now. Uh, there's a lot here. I'm just going to pop out. I like the animation of, of this, so I wanted to go through that. Okay, I'm going to reload this. little bigger. There we go. So we've got a poor little mouse here. We're going to experiment on. So there's a rough strain. And now this is a streptococcal bacteria. And this rough strain of bacteria was added. Just take a little sample of them out there. And we put it in mice. Now this strain of bacteria could, um, there's two different versions of this. We'll look at a, there's a rough strain and a smooth strain. And they were investigated to see whether or not they would cause pneumonia. So let's in Infect the mouse, give it two weeks to give the immune system a bit of a battle. And it turns out, what do we have? The mouse lived. This particular uh, streptococcal strain didn't 
cause um, pneumonia that the mouse would die from. A little question, um, did the mouse uh, suffer from the disease or not? Sort of think about that for a second, sort of pause, right? I'll also put this on the course site, but of course I'm going through it. And the mouse, just wanted to click on that quick, the mouse itself, it didn't die from the disease, right? And the rough strain wasn't pathogenic. Okay. Let's go through one quick one there. Now let's look at the smooth strain. The smooth strain was a little bit different. This, when you tended to look at it, uh, the cell walls were smooth, not as jagged. And they're, it's an oversimplification of the drawing, but they're just illustrating a point. When this was added to mice, this particular strain, this version, well, what happened was this was uh, very pathogenic and the mouse is toast. Okay, so that smooth strain, not so nice when you add it to mice. Okay, so it's the pathogenic strain. Now here's where it gets a little bit interesting. You take the smooth strain and you, you heat it up, right? So they heat killed it. I thought, well, what would happen, right? If we denature those bacteria, we cook them, what would happen? Well, inject, well, once it's cooled down, mind you, inject it into the mice. And because it was heat killed, after two weeks, ta-da, the mice were just fine. Okay, so if you heat kill the pathogenic smooth variety, well, the mouse should be fine. So those bacteria are incapable of causing disease. Well, because they've been cooked. Now, we'll go back. They did a, the Griffiths experiment. What happened here is they, they took it a little bit further. Again, in this case, the bacteria were heat killed and they were allowed, it was allowed to cool down for a little while. So boil them. Interesting. Well, what happens if we take the boiled deadly ones, boiled smooth, and we combine it with rough? Eh, let's put them together. Let's see what happens. Now, at first glance, you'd look at this and think, well, you know, there's, there's nothing there. I mean, the smooth are dead, and they shouldn't be able to do anything. And the rough, well, heck, you know, they, they didn't cause disease at all. They should be fine. I'm giving it away a little bit here. But when that was injected into mice and we gave it two weeks, the only living organisms to cause pathology were the rough. Now the crazy thing here is there was a transformation. The rough were transformed. They started to act differently. In fact, the rough uh, phenotype, well, the rough didn't look rough anymore. Now they started to look smooth, like they had been reprogrammed. So we'll look at that a little bit, but it's providing a lot of text here for you. But what essentially had happened is the smooth bacteria had burst open and they'd released something. They didn't know what it was. Was it was it DNA or was it just was it just a renegade protein? What got in to those rough bacteria? They weren't quite certain. So Griffith had, an, have an, had a hypothesis that something had caused a transformation. So we call this um, Griffith's transformation experiment. Lo and behold, we go and take a look at the bacteria recovered from the uh, respiratory tissue of the mouse and from, their, uh, and from the blood, and we find there's no rough bacteria in there. They're smooth. They've transformed. Holy smokes, what's going on? Right? So... Smooth bacteria, when it was heat killed, had released something, cellular components. They weren't certain what that was. That could have been DNA, it could have been protein, they didn't know. But when that was introduced to the rough bacteria, well, hmm, something got taken in. And in solution, rough literally transformed into smooth. And that is what we call the Griffiths experiment. 
Now, the Griffiths experiment essentially proved one of two things because they didn't know exactly what had gone in. Um, it proved, it, it really came down to the fact that it was either what came out could have been DNA or it could have been protein. So here's the, the notes portion of it. Injecting the mice with the rough bacteria and they live and the smooth that kills them. And there's that interesting combination right there. He killed smooth and live rough. And all of a sudden, we have the same pathology as if it was live smooth. And we know that the, that really wasn't the case. Hmm. So there's live smooth cells in the mice. How did that happen? Things that make you say, hmm. Well, nice little shot of it. Take that in. Right? Fascinating little experiment. So what did this all mean? Well, it comes down to the fact that what remained was one of two things. It was protein or it was nucleic acid somehow a transformation had occurred. Some kind of transforming material. And in science, you can't say that it was this one or this one without further experimentation. You just can't. It's a 50-50 sh shot. By modern standards, I mean, we could look back and say, hey, it's totally the nucleic acids. It's the DNA. But at the time, no additional work needed to be done. Transformation. Now think a little bit within the context of what you already know, right? We know a little bit about genetics, but that wasn't as well known at this point. So along comes another experiment. Now this one is called the Hershey Chase experiment. Here's how I remember this. Um, the Hershey Chase experiment chases Griffith's work to prove once and for all whether it was DNA or whether it was protein. Now you might remember this little critter. We saw this guy. Remember the T4 bacteriophage? The bane of E. coli? Yeah, Escherichia coli does not like this very much. This little hypodermic needle, uh, this little genetic delivery system, likes to deliver viral DNA Call that. If this is our friend E. coli, these little guys will land, of course, not drawn to scale. And they're very good, and in fact, completely specific to injecting material into E. coli. Now, at this point, I'll just leave that sort of as an unknown. Why don't we watch and see what they inject? Let's see what goes into E. coli. Because once we know what goes into E. coli, uh, we should have a pretty good idea what takes over the E. coli cell and produces all the baby viruses to the point where poor E. coli just bursts, right? Well, what we have to figure out is, is it the DNA, which is in the core, in the capsid, or is it the protein that is the, the body, the shell, if you will, of the virus? It's just perfect if you think about it. Well, it comes right down to it. If it's either DNA or protein, well, what better to look at than something like the T4 bacteriophage, a virus? Because that's all it's made up of. Let's see what goes inside. What causes the transformation? Now, the neat thing that you can do is that you can do radioactive labeling of DNA and you can also radio label protein because protein's got quite a bit of sulfur in it. So radioactive sulfur. And in the case of DNA, you radio label its phosphorus content. There you go. And by looking at the concentrations of the radioactive material, what you want to find out is 
what radioactive material, it's like a tag, what goes inside of E. coli? If it's radioactive sulfur, then we know it's protein. So let's just make a little note there. Right. The body. Or is it going to be the radioactive phosphorus that we find in DNA? Which one is it? Well, stay tuned. We're about to find out. So in just by duplicating the experiment several times, you look to see once the E. coli cells are infected by the phage, you watch and you say, OK, there's the radioactive sulfur on the outside. So since that's basically the protein, this is the uh, protein side of the experiment. So let's cheer for protein. Protein's genetic material. And this side is nucleic acids, specifically DNA. One side will cheer for nucleic acids. The other side will cheer for protein. And sort of watch what happens. Well, as it turns out, radioactive sulfur never went inside. It always stayed on the outside. And in retrospect, that makes a lot of sense because the body of the phage, once it's delivered its genetic material, it just drops off and falls off. It doesn't go inside of its host. It parasitizes, but the uh, protein capsule never goes in. So it turns out because the protein never went in, that wasn't the infective material as it turns uh, out to be in this case. No, what the infective material was, and if you follow the radioactive phosphorus in the DNA, it was found to have entered into the cell. And not only that, in the virus babies, we found trace amounts of radioactive material in their genetic code. So what did this mean? This meant that as new little baby viruses were produced, in the cell, it must have been in response to the signal from DNA, a nucleic acid, not from protein. So DNA was, the, was and is the master molecule of life. And that's it. The Griffith experiment narrowed it down to two, and this radioactive labeling narrowed it down from two to one. And that's classic science. The, it's absolutely clear. Great experiment. There we go. It's all about the DNA. One whole massive slide, just to say that. There we go. So good. So now when you know what the genetic material is, you can focus in on it and study it to death. And in um, this modern era, we have study DNA in such incredible detail that we know the entire human genome. We know E. coli's genome. When I was going to university in the 1990s, we had, we had uh, just finished uh, typing out that information. So quite impressive. Never, I always love it. In the middle of a screencast, my phone likes to go off. Anyhow, moving right along. So as far as the discovery of DNA, once it was found that this material was the genetic code, then what was looked at was, well, what is its structure? Like that twisty ladder that we all sort of know and understand and say, well, that's a fabulous molecule. Well, who came up with the structure of that? Now, who you're looking at here is you're looking at Watson and Crick. who won a Nobel Prize in science for coming up with the, or deducing the structure of DNA, how it's a twisted ladder and how it's, uh, it's twisted structure it allows for incredible uh, compression of genetic information and how it unwinds so in, in sections so that portions of it can be read. Now, the good thing is, having studied our, uh, our biochemistry unit, we could sort of hurry through here. There's four, I always love to say it this way, 
DNA is a four letter alphabet and it turns out to make three letter words. The three letter words we'll talk about in a bit. But in the four letter alphabet, DNA has two chemical families. You've got the purines, those are the double ringed ones, and the pyrimidines. So adenine and guanine are in one family and that's called the purines. And the pyrimidines are the other family, cytosine and thymine. And if you remember our rules, we'll go back a little bit. Purines bond with pyrimidines. Now, adenine bonds with thymine, and cytosine bonds with guanine. Now, I was drawing uh, hydrogen bonds there, and you'll see a little bit more of that as we move along. But DNA itself is a it's a twisted ladder. It's got a it's got a very interesting structure. Now by twisted ladder, and draw it to the side here. If you think of a ladder with rungs, and these rungs are the nucleic acids, then the genetic info is in the center. The outside is just structural, right? And that's the same as this. But it's these pairings in the middle that matter the most. So in this case, um, the way they're color coding it, adenine and thymine, cytosine and guanine, you can see it. The sugar phosphate backbone, really what you're looking at there, The sugar phosphate backbone that they're looking at is just repetitive links of phosphates and ribose sugars going up and down the molecule. It gives it a lot of structure, but that's not genetic info. Okay, the adenines, guanines, cytosines, and thymines. These guys in the center are the genetic info. That's an important distinction. Oh, that won't highlight. Again, we'll get down to the nucleotide. Now, a nucleotide isn't DNA. It's, it is just a monomer of a nucleic acid. So your phosphate group off to the side. This is why we just sort of draw it as a circle like that, linking down to your deoxyribose sugar. Now it's called deoxyribose because there's an oxygen missing from there. In uh, ribonucleic acid, right, RNA, that oxygen is present. But in DNA it's not. So that's why it's deoxyribonucleic acid. And you're looking at a two-ring structure. So you know you're looking at a purine there. And that's one of the, the bases of the genetic code. And it's nitrogenous because... There's all the nitrogen right there. Voila. Now, there's an interesting experiment, and it led to something called Chargaff's Rule. And this experiment, when they were analyzing DNA, Really what they found, and look at the date, 1949, it makes sense, right? Now they know DNA is the genetic material. They noticed that the amount of adenine always equaled pretty well the amount of thymine. And cytosine equaled the amount of guanine. Well, okay, well that's that totally makes sense. It proves who goes with who. Adenine and thymine are found in similar proportions because they bond with each other, so you need an equal amount for those bonds. And cytosine and guanine should be in equivalent ratios because, well, they're partners. So there you go. So now you know who kind of goes with who. And now you get those rules. It was an interesting rule. Like A must bond with T because they're equivalent amounts. Cytosine with guanine. Well, there you go. Neat things you can deduce from experiments. Chargaff's rule. Now Watson and Crick, to get a little bit more information... Um, relied upon some expertise from Rosalind Franklin. Now, 
let's see if I can just pop out here. There we go. Because I have some things in the browser to show you. Now, Rosalind Franklin, uh, depicted here, did some incredible work with x-rays. She bounced um, x-rays off DNA. Now, she didn't just bounce them off the side. When you look at this famous image right here, she didn't bounce them off the side. She bounced them off the top. Or you could think of it as bouncing off the bottom. Let's see here. I wanted to show you this. So just mute that. Okay. Now this is how to build a DNA molecule. Now in this case we're going to look at it from the top. So we've got a top view and a side view. Now watch. Okay so since that's thymine I'm going to choose this and I'm going to click it into place. You can see right here how my base pairing has been accomplished. And here comes adenine. And we're pairing and we're building up the molecule. Uh, if you've ever played Jenga, this is sort of like building from the bottom to the top. Okay, cytosine. I guess I better choose a guanine. There you go. And if you choose the wrong one, if you try to do this, it, it won't do it because it's not a base pairing. And you go like this. Now, this could be great fun, but you notice, you notice as you're looking down on it, how it looks sort of, it has this inward spiral. You look at this structure here. Now here's why I chose this. Because when you go back to Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallography, look at what you see. You see the base pairing and you see it leading down into the distance. You're staring at the top of the DNA molecule. And this provided three-dimensional information about the nature of that uh, molecule, that structure, to enable Watson and Crick to finish their work on the structure of the DNA molecule of life. Now, when it came time to award the Nobel Prize, unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin, she's not in, she was not in the Nobel Prize picture. Watson and Crick um, get credit for it, but there's been a movement that Rosalind Franklin should posthumously, or in her death, be added to, as, uh, well, as a recipient for that Nobel Prize for the work that she did. And you could see the justification, right? Okay. There we go. There's where we were. So the use of X-ray crystallography helped nail down the fact that DNA is, is helical. Um, it's long strands, extremely repetitive, right? I mean, you have A's and G's and C's and T's. And you'll get long, you'll get these long um, repetitive sections. And it turns out genetics, that's highly relevant. For example, um, sections like this exist, right? And they indicate uh, places where DNA um, sort of starts to be read to make, uh, to express genes. It's called a TATA box. Um, but you'll study more about that if you stick to this game and, and do biology or or if you study um, medical fields for example um, moving forward in your education. So Watson and Crick uh, construct the model and they figure out that the phosphate groups are sticking to the outside and that um, the ribose sugar is giving structure and that the genetic information, the A's and the T's and the G's and the C's, are going towards the inside. They also learn that the molecule itself, due to, um, due to some hydrogen bonding tricks and a few other tricks of the trade, um, assumes a helical shape. Hmm. And you get this molecule as a result. Now think about this. The distance between each rung of the ladder you are not going to be able to fit your feet in here. 34 one hundredths of a nanometer. Now, you say nanometer, what's that? Well, here's why Apple called their, um, their little player once upon a time the iPod Nano. Nano means small, and I don't just mean small. This is 34%, okay, 34 one hundredths of a billionth 
of a meter. Not just a billionth, 34% of a billionth. That's tiny. And the distance between each of the twists is only around three and a half nanometers. That's very small. So if computer scientists could program uh, computers this way, they could s imagine if the hard drives could hold this amount of information. We have tremendous storage potential because the molecule is so tiny and our cells can hold so much of it. And again, just kind of zooming in here, right? There is your sugar to phosphate. Ooh, there we go. It's adjusting. Sugar to phosphate. Combination. Just sort of an oversimplification of the drawing. But um, what I like about the drawing is here they show the hydrogen bonds. That's what the H's are. And they show them as... The double hydrogen bond here and the triple bond between our cytosines and our guanines just helps you to visualize it a little bit more now one thing to pay attention to is if you notice it looks a little upside down doesn't it <laughs> you look at the uh you look at the deoxyribose sugars there and they're upside down and the phosphate it's even written upside down well the molecule itself is said to be anti-parallel it means if it runs one way, it runs oppositely in the opposite direction. Okay. Now, th this is a little bit more of something you discuss at university, but they talk about the three prime, oops, three to five prime direction. For now, just think of it as if this is three prime, then if you go this way, that's five prime. So the opposite direction, okay, um, would be uh, 5 prime to 3 prime. And that's really all they're trying to discuss here. 5 to 3, 3 to 5. So just write it in here. This is the 5 prime end, and this would be the 3 prime end. Okay, Prime is just a single sort of apostrophe. Now at the bottom, what they've done is they're just showing the sequence. Um, and the due to the base pairing, uh, that's a way of looking at it flat so that it's a little bit easier to notice uh, or to observe. And it's 5 to 3, 3 to 5. Anti-parallel. So we're going to stop here. That's the, that's the first bit of um, our lesson, which is just the history and structure of DNA. Now, uh, this is a predicate or a setup for our next lecture, which talks about since we know how DNA comes together, we can predict how the molecule will replicate. Case in point, we know that adenine and thymine go together, and we know that cytosine and guanine go together. Now, if the molecule has to split, if you go from one molecule to two, then what you want to do is look at the mechanism for that. Uh, as it turns out, DNA only, will only go together in really one fashion. So it's a very... Um, reliable molecule for replication purposes. But for now, we're going to pause. And thanks for listening, ladies and gentlemen. And we'll see you again in the next lecture, which is all about replication of DNA. And, well, a whole bunch more. Have a good one.